Okay, so I gotta show you something. A couple days ago, I was browsing through YouTube and this is what I found. Edward Scissorhand, played by the one and only Tom Cruise. Wait, somehow I thought someone else was playing him. Must be wrong, probably. <laughs> you may have recently seen fake clips of celebrities shared around the web. We all made Donald Trump the 45th president of the United States. These are known as AI-generated synthetic media or deepfakes. Deepfake. 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 A new sophisticated way of making synthetic versions of people's faces. Making the spread of misinformation so much easier. It's the new buzzword in the AI world. Scroll down your timeline on Instagram, TikTok, even LinkedIn, and you're pretty likely to encounter one without even realizing it. Now, imagine we could recreate any face, voices, entire human beings. Opportunities from synthetic media are vast, such as their application in their creative industries or even in medicine. But there are some risks. Deep fakes are being used to commit a new form of hate crime. And the main targets of these deep fakes are women. So how are deep fakes affecting our lives? And how are they predicted to change? Whether we can trust what we see. Before we get started, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Now, I want you to take a look around yourself and answer the following question. How many of the objects you see around can be found in nature? Unless you're watching this video outside, you will probably find that the majority of objects around you uh, were created in a lab through a synthetic process. Synthetic processes essentially break down a material into its most essential components and reassemble them into a newer, non-natural or synthetic compound. That's something we've done to create synthetic fiber, rubber, diamonds, increasingly even genetics, basically anything. Now, a similar process can work also in the world of media. Of course, we're not talking here about chemical components, but rather about individual data points. You break them down to their finest components and through a neural network, you rebuild them into an image of a person that doesn't exist or a voice that doesn't mm. belong to anyone. This is what is called AI generated synthetic media. And it's basically the fancier umbrella term for describing deepfakes. Of course, recreating images is hard. Just remember that one time when a Spanish woman tried to restore a fresco of Jesus and where that ended. For algorithms, it's been similarly hard to recreate things, but through recent advances in AI, synthetic media has become ever more realistic. In the past couple months, there's literally been an explosion of deepfakes, including new apps that put the technology right at our fingertips. One person who's been documenting the development of deepfakes over the past years is Henry Eider. Henry is one of the global experts on the topic. He's been featured in the New York Times, The Guardian, Al Jazeera, you name it. There's been a lot of buzz around synthetic media recently. Uh, what exactly are we dealing here? The term deepfakes roughly refers to what we kind of call AI-generated synthetic media. This kind of encompasses a whole range of different uses. That could be face swapping, facial reenactment, where your facial expressions are mapped onto someone else's face. And I, and I said, uh, Seth Rogen was like, you know, it was amazing. He has like a, you know, a bike track in his backyard. It's phenomenal. <laughs> and, and I did a Seth Rogen impression and it was like I did a magic trick. Tom Cruise was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And he points to me. <laughs> There's a bit of a debate around kind of whether deepfakes refers explicitly to malicious use cases and non-malicious use cases are just synthetic media. If someone hadn't told me that this footage here of Tom Cruise is actually a deepfake, I would have probably guessed that it's the real Tom Cruise. Now, of course, all these apps and the footage of Tom Cruise, it, it's all fun and stuff. But with the technology becoming increasingly mature, there's also a much darker side to all of this. Deepfakes emerged first in 2017 with the explicit use of swapping female celebrities' faces into pornographic footage. In a 2019 report that I wrote, we found 96% of deepfakes were pornographic, but there are loads of different use cases which present a variety of different threats. 
um, disinformation being one, um, you know, creating deep fakes that show someone saying something or doing something they've never actually done with uh, defamatory incriminating effects. There have been documented campaigns of these style GAN images, these images of non-existent people, which look highly realistic, um, being used to adorn profiles to kind of uh, masquerade as real people. Deep fakes are a threat to any process where, you know, visual or audio communications play an integral role in decision making or day-to-day -day processes. Hearing about so many negative use cases, the inevitable question that comes to mind when thinking about deepfakes and synthetic media is should we just ban the technology altogether or can there also be positive use cases? So I started doing a bit of research into what could actually be the benefits of a technology that has at its heart creating deception with the greatest possible accuracy. And I struggled finding answers quite a bit. Initially, I thought about Google Duplex, a voice assistant that sounds almost entirely real. No happening out here. Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm -hmm. Saves us time, cuts costs. Sounds pretty good. But then, is it ethical to have a robot place a call to someone without that person necessarily knowing that they are speaking to a machine? To me, that felt a bit like a gray area. So I brought this up with Henry Eider, who knew about some use cases which literally blew my mind. The nuance that we need to add to the discussion is that, yeah, not all deep fakes are bad, although the majority of them at the moment may seem to be. The technology itself has got, you know, some positive use cases, both in the kind of commercial world and also in, you know, in, in, in society. Synthetic media rather are providing a whole new way to improve VFX. Synthetic dubbing is providing companies with a way to kind of modify marketing content a lot more efficiently. Also presents opportunities, for example, in the areas like the gaming sector to personalize characters um, in a really realistic way. Um, and in the kind of more broadly social good sense, you know, there have also been cases, for example, where synthetic voice audio has been used to personalize uh, synthetic voices for people who have lost the ability to speak due to things like degenerative disease. We've also seen some kind of quite controversial cases which are kind of ethically ambiguous where um, people have been kind of synthetically resurrected. Hang on, did he, did he just seriously say synthetically resurrected? This is obviously a whole new level from simply recreating images or some footage, right? The future of deepfakes in synthetic media is not only about us creating funny videos of Tom Cruise or other celebrities, but it is about creating synthetic human beings. All right, so what do I mean by this? Here's an example to remember from the past. Simone. I, th I think, I got it. Am I the only one knowing this? Simone is a movie made in 2002, which deals precisely with this topic of synthetic human beings. Without spoiling anything, the movie is about a film director called Victor Taransky, played by Al Pacino, uh, who is producing a movie when all of a sudden his lead actress quits. He really needs to find someone on short notice, so he decides to create a synthetic actress to star in his movie, uh, and he calls her Simone. His movie is released, it becomes a massive hit, and people are literally crazy about Simone. Everyone wants to get an autograph, speak to her, meet her in person, essentially. So the whole movie is about how he tries to keep her non-physical existence secret. Now, when I watched Simone, I felt that this movie is actually not really about how uh, hundreds of thousands of fans were deceived. It's about real people developing real emotions for a synthetic human to whom they've built a relationship that feels genuine and real. If we recreate new types of beings that we ascribe meaning and emotion and that behave just like you and I, then there are inevitable questions about rights, obligations, and ownership of these new beings. Okay, here's a question to keep you up all night. Is Simone real? Let me know your answers in the comment section below. Most media has focused on the negative use cases and consequences of deepfakes and synthetic media. And don't get me wrong, not without any reason. But the more I started digging into how synthetic media technology works, 
the more I actually started understanding the sheer possibilities of it. If we can recreate virtually anything to a hyper-realistic level, what would this enable us to do? There are no limits as to what will be possible, other than technical possibilities matching our force of imagination. But there are some very important ethical questions that need answering. Synthetic media has started blurring the boundary between what we perceive as being real or not. And the ethics of their application are far from clear. What is certain is that synthetic media is here to stay. And in the next years, it will become increasingly effective, increasingly realistic, and increasingly widespread. This is a brave new world which we're moving into with, with, um, with synthetic media. Um, and we need to make sure that we've got the responsible architecture in place so that as it becomes more ubiquitous and becomes more prevalent, um, we're in the best position we can be to encourage those positive uses whilst also countering the malicious ones.